Uh, hello, everyone. So, hi, my name is uh, Joe Arnold. Um, I'm the CEO of Swift Stack. I'm John Dickinson, uh, Director of Technology at Swift Stack and also Project Technical Lead for Swift. Um, I've been working with Swift for a couple of years now. Um, uh, we formed Swift Stack to be a center of excellence for Swift, so we provide uh, tools for deployment, management, monitoring, that sort of thing, along with support and training for OpenStack Swift. Um, so today, we're going to talk about Swift, and this is going to be an introduction talk to Swift. So we're going to cover a broad base of things and go at the surface of a, of a few things. So what we're going to talk about is Swift and OpenStack, an overview of OpenStack Swift, Swift use cases, and Swift architecture. So first, Swift and OpenStack. Uh, Swift began development in 2009 at Rackspace. So Rackspace was building something to be competitive to Amazon S3, and what they came up with was cloud files. In 2010, OpenStack was announced, and Swift was one of the two projects, Nova and Swift, and that's what was, became uh, OpenStack two years ago. And the context at which it was developed was, it was there was already a large scale, scale system at Rackspace that needed to be built uh, to handle the amount of data and the amount of users. And so that was the context in which it was developed. Now, currently, there are over 70 developers uh, on the project, uh, and there's a lot of momentum. You can go get Swift today from lots of different service providers. You know, Rackspace, of course, where it all started. HP Cloud has an implementation of OpenStack Swift. Internap, KT in Korea, uh, Softlayer, they've done some cool things around metadata search in Swift. Uh, Hilex in Australia, uh, Enovance in France. So you can get Swift today. Um, so I'm gonna pass it next to John, who's gonna go over an overview of Swift and of object storage. Great, thanks. So the reality is that everybody has data, and it's always growing, and you've got to figure out a way to reliably store it. And all of your data, though, doesn't cleanly fit into just one kind of storage system. You've got customer data that's really good in a relational uh, sense, so it works well in relational databases. You've got uh, backups. Uh, you've got web content that you would use on your website, uh, potentially customer information, static files that you need to display. The reality is, though, that these things don't fit cleanly into one thing. You're not going to put your web content into your database, and you're probably not going to put your customer information into flat files someplace. And you're certainly not going to want to store all your backups on expensive SSDs. So what it turns out is that there are basically three general types of, object, uh, of storage that you can uh, use. So let's go over each of those in turn and figure out where Swift fits in. The first kind is block storage. Second type is file storage, and the third type is object storage. Block storage is something that's probably familiar to several people here, and it takes a raw, unformatted device and exposes that directly to the application. So a common use case here is databases. They uh, are really, it, block devices are very important when you need um, very fast access and highly customized access patterns onto your data. Databases make great use of this. And of course, databases are going to be uh, very good for storing relational customer information. File storage is probably the most familiar to all of us because what we, it's what we use every day. You see it every time you open up your laptop, you work on a desktop. Uh, the concept here is you have a formatted drive and that you deal with files and, and directories. They're nested within one another. But the limitations of file systems are that they don't generally work exceptionally well when you're dealing with a very large amount of content or, or a sp uh, specific piece of content that has to be accessed quite a bit. Some of the restrictions around this have to do with the POSIX compliance layer that uh, file systems conform to. However, when you res res uh, lax these, uh, these POSIX constraints, one thing you can uh, do is start to scale extremely large. And that's where object storage comes in probably the least, amount, uh, least familiar to most people. Object storage takes a blob of data, just a chunk 
uh, oftentimes extracted as a file, but to just a blob of data, and it's designed to store that reliably and cheaply and massively. Object storage is very good for uh, unstructured data that can grow without bound. So when you're talking about backups, uh, snapshots, archiving, those sorts of things, very uh, large blobs of data, you, you're gonna always take your back backup so that aggregate content is going to grow quite a bit. Static web, do do uh, static web content, uh, documents, these other sorts of things, very good use cases for object storage. So where does Swift fit in? Swift is an object storage system. It takes unstructured data uh, and stores it very cheaply and reliably and at very high concurrency. Swift is highly scalable. And it's highly scalable in a couple of different ways. One is that you can continually add, add on your backend storage to Swift and it will continue to grow. And number two, you can continually modify, uh, you can con continually expand the front end piece of Swift so that you can meet the uh, data concurrency requirements that you have for your particular use case. Swift is also extremely durable. We use uh, three full replicas of all of your data. And beyond that, Swift is smart enough to know a little bit about the layout of your actual uh, infrastructure and optimizes the data placement so that each particular replica is in a distinct availability zone. Or even if it can't choose distinct availability zones, it's gonna choose different uh, servers and different hard drives. And what this guarantees is that you will not have a data, you'll not have data loss and you probably won't even have any data availability in the case of, uh, certainly in the case of common hardware failures and even uh, major hardware failures, losing entire racks of, or even d data center rooms. Uh, you can still have a functioning and running and available Swift cluster. Swift is highly concurrent. It is designed with zero uh, shared, uh, shared knowledge in the system. There is no single point of failure. And so you can continually add to Swift and it is horizontally scalable. It's optimized not for a single stream throughput, but rather um, you can do 10,000 streams at once or however many you need. And this, this is uh, reflected uh, this is, this is reflective of uh, where Swift came from and uh, being built for a large public service provider. Swift is built for operators. Coming out of Rackspace, and I was uh, part of that team that helped build, uh, that helped build Swift at Rackspace, uh, we worked extremely closely with the guys who were going to be actually running the system in production and the guys who actually had to answer the pager call at 3 a.m. And so what, it meant, what, what this means is that we had to design this thing so that, A, it's going to be up and running and suitable for the very large production use case. Uh, but B, guess what? You've got to wake up tomorrow morning and sit next to the same guy who just had to uh, wake up at 3 a.m. because of some bug that I introduced. I, I don't want that to happen. So uh, it was designed so that it would be very uh, robust in the face, case of failures. It would uh, implement uh, some self-healing properties so that your operators don't have to wake up at 3 a.m. or come in, on, come in to work on the weekend if they, um, in the case of common, common failures. Beyond this, Swift is designed, uh, built on top of standard technologies that have been around and been well tested for, for very long times. So for example, it uh, uses standard file systems to actually implement the data storage piece of each, uh, on each object store. It also uses common technologies that are very familiar to operations and uh, admins uh, everywhere. Things like uh, using rsync as a data transport mechanism for efficiently moving your data between different object servers. Thank you, John. And so on to, on to Swift use cases. And uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'll just go through a few use cases you know, that we're seeing with customers and in the field uh, with, with, with how they're using Swift. And so uh, we're gonna talk about uh, web and mobile applications, private file sharing applications, people using it for data analytics, and infrastructure as a service. And so first, web and mobile applications. And so within that, uh, very popular website and mobile gaming application. And so the, the big top five Websites. This is Wikipedia. They're using Swift, um, and what they're doing is they're storing images, audio, video into the Swift cluster. 
And the facility that they provide for their editors is that they can size an image on how big it'll appear on the, on, on the page. And that gets resized on the fly, lazily, and gets stored back into the Swift cluster. And with Swift, what you can do is you can write middleware to perform ac actions like that, in this case, image resizing. And they also serve a lot of traffic. And how they're doing that is, well, remember, it's an object storage system. And the API that's being used is HTTP. We've been in web infrastructure for a while. We know that there's a lot of solutions for uh, caching content via HTTP. And I think they use a combination of uh, squid varnish, I think? I think so. Um, and that sits directly in front of the Swift cluster. That means that hot content can be cached, stored in memory, and you can build that out. So in the case, in most web cases, you see like 5%, 10% of the content is the most popular that gets cached, but then the rest of that stuff uh, that's infrequently accessed, it's still readily available. It's, it's served from bit disk, but just not as frequently. So you might see like Rover Curiosity gets cached, a diagram of how to implement D plus trees, and maybe not so much, and that's, that's in the long tail of, of, of content. So that's what it enables them to do. Uh, the next, uh, go mobile gaming. So it's a big mobile gaming site, and so what they're doing is they're serving out game assets uh, directly out to their users. They're handling ingesting uploads directly from those devices into Swift. Um, they're serving the content of the games themselves, the content themselves, uh, and all the while having to handle massive concurrency. And so remember, HTTP is served directly from the device, but that also works in reverse, right? So you can, you can upload content directly up from the device. So in the case of uh, mobile devices, those things are producing, I mean, a lot of content, right? They're, people are interacting with them, they're playing games on them, they have cameras now on them to video record. A lot of data is coming from these devices, and that's getting stored in the Swift cluster. Now, if there's a common asset that they need to distribute, and it needs to be very snappy, one of the facilities Swift has is content delivery integration built into the API. So you can have an object and ask for its CDN URL, and then embed that into the application. And so then that will be, the Swift cluster will be used as the origin for the subsequent requests. And then massive concurrency, right? So because you can, as John mentioned, you can scale out each of those, er each of the levels of the, the Swift cluster, you can handle a tremendous amount of, of users all within the same uh, storage system. And what, what, what typically we're seeing uh, is people have built out that infrastructure and they're using some sort of hash on the user. So they're sending users to multiple different storage systems. And that adds complexity, because now the application has to understand which storage system do I put data in for this particular user. Um, and with, 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 with how they're using Swift, you can remove that, have a single namespace to put data into. Uh, private file sharing applications. Uh, in this case, it's a consult big consulting company, and they need to support enterprise authentication. What that means is Active Directory. And fortunately, uh, Swift has a, a, a very pluggable authentication mechanism so that you can swap out different auth components uh, to service the request. Data analytics. So we have a, there's another a consumer devices company. And what they're doing is they have lots of devices and they're all sending up data into the Swift cluster. But they need to process that data. And so what they're doing is integrating that with Hadoop. And the marriage kind of works like this. You have Swift, which is like a tractor because it prioritizes uh, durability, availability, uh, high concurrency, so it takes advantage of those features. Hadoop is like the sports car because they're tuning it for performance, turning off all the right caching so they can crunch through lots of data very quickly. And so the storage between HDFS and Swift are very different and tuned for different purposes. 
then what they did was they wrote a client to take data that's in Swift, tell Hadoop about it, that client then feeds the results of that job back into the Swift cluster. So it's really similar to how Amazon, uh, the, their MapReduce uh, functionality integrated with S3, really similar. So that's what they're doing. And then infrastructure as a service, and it's, I guess it's not really a category so much as, uh, and I mentioned all those other service providers that are using Swift, but what we're finding is that internal IT is trying to act more like a service. So instead of building out infrastructure that's tightly coupled with an application, they're trying to provide infrastructure as an internal service uh, to service multiple users, multiple applications. Uh, so now they have concerns like chargeback to those different services, being able to, to do on-demand storage, multi-tenancy, because now they're servicing multiple applications. And the confluence of all that is now they have a larger stor storage pool to uh, that data is being stored in, and Swift, so Swift can help out with all of this. On to Swift architecture. Thanks. So let's go over how all of this works. Very high level view. We've talked about what the use cases are, basically what problems does Swift solve, so let's figure out how they solve it. Swift basically has four different pieces. There are four pieces inside of a uh, fully functioning Swift cluster. The first piece is the proxy server. And if you're around uh, any of uh, these OpenStack summits and other OpenStack conversations, you'll hear us talking about these individual pieces. The proxy server is the front end piece of Swift. This is what implements the Swift public API, and this is what customers direct or clients directly deal with. The proxy server, when it receives a, a request, will choose the appropriate back end servers from these, uh, from these storage nodes. So for example, if we're talking about a cluster with three replicas, then it will choose three appropriate replica, the three appropriate servers in the back end. At that point, it will send the request concurrently to the back end clusters. What this means is that the proxy server is not doing any sort of uh, spooling to disk, it's not doing any sort of uh, caching uh, for you, and that means that the proxy servers can actually be horizontally scaled out. So if you need to handle more concurrent requests per second, more aggregate data throughput, then what you can do is add on more and more proxy servers. Each of the proxy servers will then uh, at, send the concurrent requests down to the object servers and then wait for that response to come back. The final thing that the proxy server is responsible for is coordinating those responses from the storage nodes. Swift works on a uh, Quora model, so in a three replica cluster, if you're doing a put request, for example, it requires that at least two of your replicas have been successfully written to disk before it will send a success back to the client. What this means is that Swift will never send a request, uh, a success back to the client until that it knows that uh, with a very high degree of certainty that your data is securely and durably stored within the cluster. The second piece of a Swift cluster are the object servers. The object server is the, basically the heart of, of uh, what is actually storing your disk. The object servers receive the request from the proxy server and then write that data out. It turns out that it's quite easy to abstract the concept, as I mentioned earlier, of these blobs of data as files. And so when we were designing Swift, we were looking in to figure out how to efficiently store the, these files on disk and being able to do it reliably and simply, and then also store the associated metadata with that. And it turns out there's a really good technology that's been around for decades that already does that, and it's called a file system. So we implemented uh, the object service to write out to the file system, and then all of the metadata on this object is stored in the extended attributes of a file system. And what this means is actually that Swift can run on any uh, file system that you have as long as that supports extended attributes. We have a few recommendations of what we think is best based on our testing and our uses, but um, you can use uh, whatever you find is most appropriate for your infrastructure. The third major piece of a functioning Swift cluster are the account and container servers. These servers are responsible for maintaining listings of the thing underneath it. So Swift's data is organized in a fairly flat namespace, uh, but it can be delineated and broken up into the different accounts. So that's how it handles the multi-tenancy. The accounts store a listing of each of the containers that are in that account. And the, the uh, account namespace that you give to a customer is therefore also further broken down by that customer uh, into containers. The containers therefore will also store a listing of the objects that are in that particular ca container. 
The accounts and containers store a little bit of additional uh, metadata as well. For example, the total number of bytes stored and the total number of objects and containers in the, uh, the container and account. Um, these together uh, provide the listing support that you get with Swift, but uh, for the most common use case, uh, the most common request that you generally see on a Swift cluster, the read requests, these are, are completely out of the data path, and so therefore um, are not a limitation on your uh, request scalability. The final piece of a functioning Swift cluster are the consistency processes. These are the background processes that run on your storage nodes and ensure that Swift's da the data that Swift is storing is both uh, correct and is, uh, fulfills the entire durability guarantees that Swift is, uh, is giving you. So there's a few processes, one of which is a, an auditing process. The auditors will uh, continually walk the file system and ensure that the data has not suffered any sort of file system corruption, not suffered any sort of bit rot that is introduced by your disks. Um, and if it detects anything like that, it will quarantine that bad data and ensure that repli and allow replication to uh, replace that particular replica with a good copy. So replication continually runs on these backend servers and uh, continually works to push out good copies to the other, to the other servers. So for example, if you have uh, one object server running, uh, it looks and sees, sees what data it has, and then it checks and sees the other two places that that data should be and pushes that data out there. The final piece of the consistency uh, servers is the, uh, the updater processes. This is what ensures that the objects actually live inside the container listing, and it uh, aggregates some of that metadata like the uh, total bytes used up from the, the container level into the account. So when we put it all together, Swift has a modular design. It's a fairly simple design, and it's based on reliable technologies that are in, uh, and each of these tiers in Swift can be independently scaled out to meet your particular use cases. The most common question I probably get about Swift is, well, wh how should I deploy this? What, what is my hardware? And my answer is always the same. It's, I don't know. It depends a lot on your data. And the ability, the, the advantage of Swift is that it's able to actually be flexibly deployed to meet your use case. Joe mentioned quite a few, uh, broad variety of things. If you're looking at archiving versus uh, mobile gaming, those have vastly different uh, usage profiles, but Swift is tunable to do that. We're gonna be sharing some more information about this on Thursday. Uh, we have some summits and would encourage you to attend. Um, starting at Thursday at nine, and nine in the morning, uh, we will be talking about how to install Swift on your laptop. If you show up with a laptop, we'll walk you through the process of getting that up and running. I will follow that by running a Swift cluster, and we'll take that uh, version of Swift that you installed in the first workshop, and then we'll go through some failure scenarios and the typical operations procedures that you would see in production. And then finally, we'll end the day after lunch uh, at 1.30 on building an application, and actually a server-side application, that can run in your Swift cluster and be interacted with by a uh, standard client, a web browser. And so the really cool thing about this is that you can show up at 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, and by 3 p.m., you can have a functioning Swift cluster running on your laptop and see the complete end-to-end -end process of how everything works. And with that, we are the last session before lunch. So how about this for questions? We'll just stop now. If you have a question, you can come up, and that way all of us can get early into the lunch line. <laughs> how does that sound? <laughs> Thanks. Thank so. you.